Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crowley. I'm back with another video. This is my vlog number two. And I'll go ahead and link right here probably to um, the vlog number one uh, in, that I did, well, it seems like a couple of months ago. And uh, that uh, would allow you to, you know, catch up with what I'm about to talk about in this video, which is to continue the uh, life story of Mark Curley. Um And in that video vlog number one, I did uh, take you through basically childhood up through um, to my post-college years where I went on this trip to uh, India and got quite uh, sick and was in the hospital there uh, for um, 12 days. And that was where I ended the story temporarily. Um, and just to kind of tell you what age I was at that point, I think it was like 24. I think I actually turned 24 in uh, India, if uh, memory uh, serves. But certainly somewhere right around there. Uh, anyway, so let's uh, continue that story. I, I came back to America uh, and, you know, is still kind of recovering from hepatitis, which was the illness that struck me uh, while I was in um, India. And uh, coming back, I, uh, in a way, I was sort of a little bit adrift in terms of, you know, what do I do next? Well, uh, a couple of things happened at that stage. One was I had a friend out in uh, um, Chicago who uh, uh, did, uh, what do you call that? Was at camps, did, uh, was like a camp counselor at a YMCA camp uh, in Wisconsin. And so uh, I went uh, off there and did that. Can you imagine having Mark Crowley as, as your camp counselor? <laughs> but that's what could have happened if you lived in Wisconsin circa 1991, 1991, somewhere in there. Uh, and so after that, I went to live with my brother, uh, Jeff, uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. For, um, it seems like six months, probably less than that. In my memory, it's longer maybe than what it actually was. But I suppose in terms of my uh, future career, the thing to say about uh, my time in Minnesota was uh, that that was when I decided to return to the Far East. And um, fatefully, that was when I had my chance to go to Japan. Um, and just as a quick side note, uh, talk about, you know, I went from camp counselor to part-time worker at a daycare center in downtown Minneapolis. So again, who knows, somewhere out there are a, a group of kids that had me as a part-time worker at their daycare center uh, in downtown Minneapolis. After that, anyway, I um, got a job by way of uh, personal connection. It's funny, I, I've sometimes said that uh, it's, it's not who you know, it's what you know. But in one case in my life, I suppose I would have to acknowledge it was who I uh, uh, knew that got me this job. I knew from my college years a woman named Robin Alexander who uh, married a Japanese guy uh, living in Japan, you know, they both lived in Japan, and he was the um, manager of an English language school there, kind of a private, um, uh, they call them cram schools, I think, over there. And uh, she had kind of given me an open invitation to work at her husband's school at some point. And I really, you know, I hadn't really, I, 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 as soon as I was uh, over my hepatitis and I still had that itch to go overseas, uh, I said, all right, here's my chance. I'll go uh, to Japan and teach English in the chilly north of Japan, the area known as Tohoku. And uh, so that would have been, let's see here, April, um, about a year after I came back from India. So I was only home for about a year. And uh, uh, most jobs in Japan begin uh, April 1st, interestingly, April Fool's Day. <laughs> that was, that's kind of when the year begins for them, even the school year begins. So that was uh, when I started doing that. And, um, you know, I had studied a little bit of Japanese. I certainly was not uh, proficient. I could sort of, you know, count to 20. I could, uh, I had some sense of the uh, way of conjugating verbs and so forth, but I, I was by no means uh, able to carry on conversation. So I was just at the beginning in terms of my Japanese at that stage in my life. Um, and uh, it was an interesting contrast. I don't know if I have any viewers out there that are from Taiwan, um, but they may be interested to hear the contrast that I found between the Japanese and the Taiwanese. 
And I can't remember in my first vlog if I talked about this very much, so I won't go at length on it, but there's a huge difference, I find, uh, culturally, uh, between, um, well, of course, between uh, people of Chinese heritage and people of Japanese heritage, but the experience of being an English teacher, uh, as I was in Taiwan, and of being one in Japan, was quite drastically different. And I got a bit of a shock, really. Um, what happens when you live in Taiwan, at least uh, for me in the um, late 80s, early 90s, was that there was a certain kind of star quality. People treated you like, oh my goodness, you're from America, you came all the way to Taiwan, let me come up and talk to you. Uh, even like, can I have my photo taken with you? There was like, uh, you felt like some kind of a fake movie star or something in certain circumstances uh, in Taiwan. Not so in Japan, certainly not in the area of Japan that I was in, in Tohoku. Uh, people are much more shy up there, a little harder to get to know people. Um, uh, we have sort of the image of uh, people from England having a certain British uh, reserve. Uh, and uh, I think the uh, Japanese are a little bit like that. Uh, I can get myself into trouble with like stereotyping and stuff. But I found that like the Taiwanese, very outgoing, very quick to come up and sort of talk to you and let their hair down and, uh, you know. Whereas in Japan, there just seemed to be a little more... Um, uh, yeah, like I said, reserve. It took a longer time to get to know people. And uh, as a result, for me, living in Japan at that time, uh, got a bit lonely, to be quite frank. I, I couldn't make a whole lot of friends. For the first time uh, in being overseas, I kind of uh, fell into just hanging out with uh, my fellow Americans. Uh, not that I regret that in a big way. I made some good friends at that stage in my life, but that did sort of harm my ability to, to learn Japanese. You know, when I lived in Taiwan, I hardly had any American friends at all. I spent all my time with uh, Taiwanese people uh, and uh, picked up Mandarin Chinese quite quickly. Um, in Japan, it took me a lot longer. But uh, the big thing about Japan, interestingly, even though it was uh, challenging for me um, socially, uh, that Japan for whatever reason, became my muse, I guess you would say, in terms of creating uh, work that would eventually get published. And uh, what I did at that stage was uh, to sit down and create my very first uh, comic book story. And that one uh, was called The Beast That Ate Morioka. Now, those of you who have seen my previous videos or have been watching for a long time, you may remember that title. I think I've shown artwork from it. I've sort of talked about it. And, uh, yeah, The Beast That Ate Morioka was my first attempt to tell a real comic book story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And um, the funny thing about that one, and this happens a lot with me as a creative person, is I, I began quite casually... Oh, do you hear the alarm? The, uh, the police sirens? They found me, people. I gotta run, I'm sorry! Uh, <laughs> anyway, now you know this is live interrupted by the uh, sirens. Uh, in any case, uh, what was I talking about there? Completely lost my train of thought. Um, I'm gonna have to actually go back and listen to hear what I was talking about. Hang on a second. Oh, right. Beast of the Day Morioka. And I, t I have a tendency to start projects quite casually, maybe not giving 100% of my effort. Uh, and so that was certainly the case with uh, Beast That Ate Morioka. I, I would just sort of casually started telling this story about a kid who accidentally invents a monster uh, in his bedroom by way of, like, uh, uh, chemistry set experimentation. <laughs> it made no sense in terms of plot. But uh, he creates this monster, and then he starts feeding the monster, and uh, it grows and gets bigger and bigger until eventually it reaches Godzilla. Uh, type proportions, and uh, that's how you get the title of the beast that ate Morioka. But th this was sort of significant just in terms of, um, I call it my practice run uh, towards creating a publishable work. I put quite a lot of effort into it by the end, and I still like the story. I keep thinking someday I may retell that story or get some use out of it. <clears throat> but, uh, the you know, the, the early pages were certainly a bit shaky in terms of the artwork. Uh, and um, there were, were aspects that would probably get in the way of it being published. For example, uh, it seems like a kid's story, but uh, there is a scene in which I have uh, a giant beer can <laughs> is used as a way of uh, 
uh, luring the monster into eating a large quantity of wasabi. Don't ask me why they need to get the monster to eat wasabi, but I don't think an American publisher in a kid story would like a beer can to figure prominently into the tale. Um, so I sort of, as time went on, I've learned a, a bit more about what, uh, you know, is appropriate and what isn't within the context of a children's story. Uh, anyway, so Beast That Ate Morioka was my uh, first um, sort of publishable piece of work. It did eventually get published in a small way here in America, but I think what happened is, you know, that was my sort of practice preparatory work, and then circa 1992, I sat down and said, okay, let's make something that really can be published. And that's how, when I sat down to create Akiko, or Akiko, as I pronounce it. It's a Japanese name. Uh, the story of the little girl who goes to another planet, a planet called Smu, and has uh, adventures with a bunch of characters. Now that's kind of a whole nother story, and maybe we'll save that for another vlog. I I keep thinking I should one day do a walk down memory lane and and talk about um, Akiko, the creation of it, the whole experience of the uh, you know it turning into a comic book and so forth. But suffice to say, I was in Japan uh, and uh, at the rate of about one um, page per week, I started creating this. Uh, comic book story about a girl who goes to another planet. And I was trying very hard at that stage to make something that would be, uh, uh, you know, capable of being published. And so it was, it was quite professional looking from page one. Uh, I used Zipatone, if uh, you know what that is, this thing it adds the gray tones, really not by computer. I didn't even own a computer at that stage. Um, but uh, by way of, you know, slicing them in with an exacto blade. Um, but that did help the work to look much more professional. And I suppose you could say it was at that stage that I got addicted to gray tones. My gray tone addiction began at that stage. And ever since then, my work has uh, rather prominently featured gray tones. Um, but let's go ahead and sort of step away from talking about the comic and just sort of talk a little bit more about my life at that stage. Like I said, I had sort of mixed feelings about Japan sort of funny to think about that now because my life has become so intertwined with it. But yeah, it's like I said, I had tr trouble making friends. And um, it, it, by the time I finished my stint there, and I was there for uh, a little over two years, I was kind of ready to go. I'd, and I felt like um, I'd had more fun in Taiwan. And, uh, you know, so unsurprisingly, uh, still not quite sure what I was going to do with my life, I turned back to the people who had employed me fresh out of college, the YMCA in uh, Taiwan. Uh, and I returned uh, right back to the town that I had been. Now there was a little bit of gap in there I, without telling you every little beat and step in my life. Uh, suffice to say, I came home for the summer of 1993 and uh, it was in the fall of 93 that I went to Taiwan for the second time. And, you know, in a lot of ways you could say it was uh, something of a repeat of what I had done for, uh, fresh out of college. I uh, was teaching uh, English and um, for whatever reason, and I can't quite explain this, I was not nearly as productive. Maybe it has something to do with the social life thing. You know, I had no social life in Japan and so I got a lot of work done. Uh, when I went to Taiwan, I would not tend to get as much work done. I was like uh, hanging around with friends and so forth. So there's not a whole lot in terms of material that I created while I was in Taiwan that could uh, later be published. That all mostly happened in Japan. So uh, I was in Taiwan for one more year. And I suppose the crucial thing in terms of my life story of that second stint in Taiwan, 1993 to 94, was somewhere in there, well, I was almost uh, 28. I think I turned 28 while I was in Taiwan that second time. And something hit me at the age of 28. I think you see the number 30 coming at you and you say, hey, you know, what am I doing here? Is this really what I want to do for the rest of my life? Am I going to be an English teacher uh, in the Far East for the rest of my life? Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, and if I had been 100% happy teaching English, I, um, you know, it would have been a great thing to do. 
Um, but no, I was not uh, completely thrilled with teaching English as my job. I wanted to be a published uh, illustrator, first and foremost. Uh, and so I thought, time to go back to America. Time to uh, try to pursue this dream of getting published. And so I wrapped up my time there in Taiwan and uh, headed on back. Now I'll just briefly say that I was very fortunate to be able to meet up with my parents uh, that fall of 1994 uh, in Beijing, in, uh, in China. And that was my kind of one and only trip to mainland China. I had a wonderful time there. Uh, it was pretty much just a vacation. Uh, but, uh, you know, having lived in uh, uh, Taiwan for, uh, uh, by that point, two and a half years altogether, my, my Mandarin Chinese was uh, in pretty good shape, and I was able to uh, really communicate with everybody there and, uh, you know, sort of added to the whole experience of being in mainland China. But I, in looking back now, just as a side note, I really think, boy, I saw the last of the old China. <laughs> uh, uh, although it had started to modernize uh, a bit by 1994, it was nowhere near uh, the sort of behemoth that it has become now, you know, highly modernized and, uh, you know, with the Olympics and everything. I can only imagine <clears throat> uh, how different Beijing is now from when I saw it in 1994. And who knows if I have any viewers out there that are familiar with uh, China, they could sort of back me up there and say, yeah, Mark, you... You saw quite a different Beijing from what you would see if you went there now. Anyway, uh, let's move along. I, uh, I came back to uh, America, 1994, and my uh, goal at that time was indeed to get published. And so I went to America's center of publishing, which is, of course, New York City. And I want to tip my hat to a good friend of mine from uh, high school named John Walter. He was living... Uh, in the area of New York City. At that time, he had an apartment in uh, Newark, uh, which is just a train ride away. And uh, so he let me stay at his place free of rent for a couple of months, which was really awesome of him. And I think I, I look back and appreciate that even more now uh, and was probably insufficiently <laughs> grateful at the time uh, that, uh, you know, he allowed me to do that. And I went around New York City, I was trying to get published, I was showing my work to all these people, and uh, maybe this is the one, you know, a lot of things in my life have gone quite smoothly, I must say, and a lot of things have sort of dropped into my lap, and uh, the dream very often came true for me uh, with a minimal amount of effort. Um, but I suppose uh, the trip to New York City was the one time where I can uh, recount um, uh, things not going all that great. And uh, for two months, I was going around tr showing my work, trying to uh, get work of some kind, uh, try to, trying to get published, uh, any kind of a job, basically, I would have taken at that stage, and I just couldn't swing it. Of course, and it's no surprise, New York is a tough town, man. It's hard to, it's hard to make it in New York. Uh, as they say, if you can make it there, you'll make it anywhere. <laughs> and I really do think it's true because uh, you can't just waltz into New York City and figure you're going to get a job in two months the way that I uh, thought that I would. Um, an interesting sort of period of my life. And as I told you, you know, I, I turned 28. I was sort of like, what am I going to do with my life? And uh, I was adrift uh, for real at this point. I was like, ah, oh, man, I'm not finding work. I'm blowing through my savings. I'm in trouble. And as we reached the uh, Christmas of 1994, I was like, this isn't working. I'm not going to make it. Ah, sorry about that. Another interruption. This is the most disjointed... <laughs> vlog video ever made in YouTube history, but uh, thanks to anyone who's uh, sticking with me this far. Uh, anyway, to uh, continue uh, on to the next part of the story, you know, I uh, like I said, I'd gone to New York City, things had not gone well, I certainly had not gotten any jobs, and so I came back um, to Detroit and uh, was staying with my parents for a while, and so, you know, as you can imagine, here I am, 28, um, Coming up on 29, uh, having to having failed in New York City and uh, living with my parents, and it just I was like, yeah, oh boy, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? 
And there was even a moment, it's funny, I look back now, there was a moment when I considered, I seriously considered, uh, going back to teach uh, English again somewhere. Like, maybe I'll try South Korea this time, you know. Uh, just because, uh, I, you know, it, it's tough on your identity to, uh, to, you know, be living with your parents and you don't have a job and all this stuff. And I was like, well, anything's better than this, you know. Uh, but around that time was when I uh, took that comic book uh, script that I had done, the 33-page story of Akiko on the planet Smoo. I made some photocopies, and I mailed it around. Now, I should maybe tip my hat to a, a man named Eric Reynolds, who works for Fantagraphic Comics. And uh, if you know Fantagraphics, you know that they're the publishers of some of the greatest uh, comics going, uh, you know, all, uh, they win so many awards, and it's just like the, the classiest, I'd say, of all the comics publishers, uh, or certainly uh, one of the most important ones in terms of the, uh, the, the books that they have uh, printed. In any case, um, I knew uh, someone from high school, Tom Powers, a high school chum of mine, and he used to work at Fantagraphics, and uh, I was heading out to... Uh, to Seattle to visit a, a friend that I'd made in uh, Japan. And I uh, talked to Tom and he said, yeah, why don't you go over to Fantagraphics? So you can meet this guy, Eric Reynolds, show him your work, see if he has any advice for you. So um, this was, when was this? 1995, maybe, seems like January. It was uh, dead of winter. I go out there to see my friend and uh, then uh, I, uh, get over somehow to, um, I can't even remember if I took a bus or whatever I did to get over to Fantagraphics and um, uh, showed my comic, uh, Akiko on the Planet Smoo, to Eric Reynolds, uh, the guy that uh, worked at Fantagraphics. And he took one look at it and he said these sort of golden words to me that no one um, had said that, you know, I could say, oh, this person really is a professional from the comics community. He said to me, Mark, this is ready to be published right now. You don't have to change anything about this story. If you just mail it around, um, you will probably find a publisher. And he gave me a list uh, out of the back of this thing called the Staros Report. I hope I'm pronouncing that name, Chris Staros. He... Uh, had a, a sort of self-published, I think it was, sort of catalog where he listed all the different comic book publishers. You know, this is the days of pre-internet or very early internet days. and So we were relying on printed publications like this. He said, just go through here. Here's a list of all these publishers. Start mailing off photocopies of uh, your comic book here. Uh, and I think you'll probably be able to find a publisher. You know, of course, well, <laughs> what I should add here is that Fanagraphics was not going to publish it. Um, uh, you know, it was good, but it wasn't that good. Let's put it that way. It was not worthy of uh, Fanagraphics, which is really uh, top-notch, you know. Uh, but he did give me the, those words of encouragement, and in a lot of ways, Eric uh, Reynolds, who I must say I don't really know very much and I haven't seen uh, over the years very much, he played a pivotal role in my life in terms of uh, giving me that that bit of an encouragement, uh, saying, look, this thing's ready to go, man. This could be published. And I was like, okay, sweet. So I made photocopies. I mean, I w went back to Detroit, living with my parents again, uh, and made photocopies of that story and mailed them around to 10 different publishers. And I think I've sort of told this story before. Uh, but uh, having mailed it to 10 different publishers, one of them, called Serious Entertainment, uh, wrote back to me and said, we love this thing, we want to publish it. Uh, and not only do we want to publish it, we want to, uh, you to consider turning it into a series, uh, which I always sort of chuckle when I, because <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the way it was phrased in the letter. We want you to consider, would you consider turning this into a series? And I was like, consider? Dude, where do I sign? You know, that was the dream, to have a comic book series. I mean, I, you got to know, I had never been legitimately published at all up until this point. Uh, so this was 1995, and I was like, yes, let's do it, let's do it. And so I, uh, uh, you know, got a contract from these guys, um, and uh, the first thing uh, uh, that, uh, I, I guess I'll take it, I'll take you up to the publication, let's do it this way, I'll take you up to the publication of Akiko on the Planet Smoo, my first big uh, publishing breakthrough, and that's where we will end this blog, blog, vlog, glog, <laughs> because it's going to go on forever if I don't. Uh, so, uh, anyway, 
um, I, I, I first met uh, Rob Horan, who was the publisher uh, of uh, the Sirius Entertainment, uh, in Chicago, of all places. He was there for a, um, a convention, a uh, sales convention comic book thing called Capital Cities, uh, long since defunct. But um, uh, I went out there uh, and, uh, you know, met him and his partner Larry, and uh, Salamone and the uh, we uh, had uh, you know a couple of meals together and so forth and they uh, were just were very cool guys and they they were like oh, we really hope you'll consider uh, going with us and again you know I was like consider man I'm there <laughs> right I was really ready to go uh, and uh, so we, I did end up signing a contract with them and um, the uh, a really cool thing happened that summer of '95. They were attending the San Diego Comic Con, and so I uh, flew out there to um, uh, present, not the comic, because it hadn't been published yet, but what they used to call ash cans. I don't know if they still make these things, but they're little, like little eight-page mini-comic things that give people a taste of uh, you know what this upcoming comic is going to be. And uh, so I went out there to attend the San Diego Comic Con, uh, and uh, met all the other people that were published by Sirius, and uh, just such an eye-opening convention. Those of you who have been there, uh, you can testify to just uh, how huge it is. Of course, this was 95. It was not quite the uh, behemoth that it is now, but it was plenty big, let me tell you. And um, so that was uh, an amazing experience to go out there, and uh, it's, you know, looking back, it was a thrill. I, I knew I had a comic on the way, and um, I, I, it seemed like finally my life was going to get going as a published person. And that's pretty much um, where we're going to have to wrap this one up, because uh, that later on that year, very end of the year, I'm going to say like between Christmas and New Year's of 1995, was when uh, Akiko and the Planet Smoo, uh, as they called it, a graphic novel, although it really looked like a comic book, you know, it was not... Um, it did not have a thick binding to it. It was only 40 pages long. Um, that was when that was published. And I think I will leave it to a future video to tell you how that comic was received and, and how the uh, continuing adventures of uh, Akiko took shape. And, uh, you know, just a final note about this video and my decision to do a vlog video right now. I just want you all to know I'm, I'm at a really busy point right now. Uh, I've committed to a lot of different things uh, uh, for a lot of different people, and I'm busy delivering on those promises. And that's why this is not a how to draw video. Uh, and uh, in fact, the, you know, this coming summer is going to be tricky in terms of <clears throat> living up to my commitment of, of a uh, you know new video every Friday. Uh, I do want to um, uh, supply how to draw videos as the vast majority of the kind of videos that I do, but they do require preparation, and, and so uh, please bear in mind, I have not forgotten you, my friends. Uh, last thing I want to do is be accused of, you know, the guy who's like, oh, you got a million subscribers, so you don't care about us anymore. Um, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that people have experienced that, where they feel a little abandoned by people that once really appreciated their subscribers. I do not want to be that way. I want to you know, you guys uh, really have changed my life and have supported me all along the way to where I am right now. Um, and I'm committed to continuing to do the, you know, the kind of videos that you guys want. I really don't want there to be any uh, lapse or decline uh, in terms of what I'm doing. And I think if you look at the quality of the videos, I, I have managed to, to, you know, uphold a certain standard. I hope you'll agree with me uh, in that regard. And uh, so uh, that's why this is a vlog video rather than a how to draw video. One last thing about this video that's uh, making it kind of different is that um, uh, Evan Burse uh, over at Cartoon Block uh, has uh, given me a little clip of video that he wants me to uh, put on a, a video to you know uh, send out to my subscribers to let you know about this Kickstarter campaign that he's doing. So that's going to be the last thing you see on. Um, this uh, this video, I'm going to just sort of tack that on there at the end. And uh, yeah, by all means, um, go check out Evan Evan's uh, channel. Go check out his Kickstarter campaign. He's a great guy. He's a very talented man. And, uh, you know, a lot of you already know that. A lot of you are already subscribed uh, to his channel. Uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know the connection between me and Evan, he actually flew out to Detroit, uh, he and his daughter, uh, at his you know own expense. 
to uh, interview me. Uh, and uh, to this day, those, uh, those interview videos are kind of the main way that a lot of people know what I look like. Uh, because uh, y you know me, I rarely, I sh last week I showed my eyes. <laughs> that was like a big breakthrough. Oh my goodness, we know what his eyes look like now. Um, so anyway, I was uh, amazed that Evan was willing to go to such uh, expense uh, just to come out and interview a dorky old dude like me. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and tack on this last thing here about Evan's uh, Kickstarter campaign. By all means, check that out. And uh, thanks so much for watching this video. And uh, I sincerely hope that by next Friday, we will have a uh, legitimate how to draw video. But I'll go ahead and lay down the pen. Thank you so much for watching this vlog. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be back with another one real soon. Hi, my name is Evan. Some of you may know me from my YouTube channel, Cartoon Block, where I show people how to draw some of their favorite characters. Today I'm here to tell you how you can get a copy of my upcoming hardcover sketchbook by going to my Kickstarter link. The book contains tons of my never before seen drawings, my sketching process, plus secrets on how to get in the animation business. And as a special bonus, Mr. Mark Crilly will be writing the foreword in the book. How cool is that? Please hurry, because the last day to pledge is July 12th, and I can't do this without your support. Thanks for checking out my project.